Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, I'm just going to do some introductions. So my name is Kelly. I'm the president of our Faith on Main college-based group at Faith Lutheran Church. Um, and we are so glad to have Mark Schuler with us today, who was born in Wisconsin, did his undergraduate work in classical Greek at Concordia Senior College in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He trained for and was ordained into the pastoral ministry of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. He received a Doctor of Theology degree from Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, specializing in gospel studies. Schuler was the chairperson of the Department of Theology and Ministry at Concordia from 2008 to 2019, specializes in New Testament and Koine Greek. He was the co-director of the University Honors Program. Since 1996, he has traveled frequently to Israel for research and teaching purposes. He has participated in the archaeological excavations at Ein Gedi and Tiberias, sponsored by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He directed the Northeast Insulae Project from 2002 to 2021 at the Hyposacita excavations of the Zinman Institute of Archaeology at the University of Haifa. Professor Schuler is Professor Emeritus of Theology, Greek, and Archaeology at Concordia University, St. Paul, Minnesota. He's a member of ASOR and the Society of Biblical Literature, for which he served as the coordinator of the Upper Midwest Region from 2003 to 2008. And actually, just this morning, he was named an associate fellow at the Albright Institute in Jerusalem for this year, which is a very, very big um, achievement. So like everyone to welcome Dr. Mark Schuller. Thank you. So I hope I remember to bring everything along because my mind has been just spinning about how we're going to go here. Okay. Hippos is a Decapolis city, one of several Greco-Roman sites generally east and south of the Sea of Galilee. Some of these sites are mentioned in the story of Jesus and in ancient writers such as Pliny, and Josephus. Hippos overlooks the Sea of Galilee to the east. Although geologically part of the Golan Heights, the mountain sits separately between valleys cut by streams. Primary access to the city was from the east, up a saddle that links the mountain to the Golan Heights. Portions of the defensive wall of the city still remain, albeit precariously. I would not stay over there. <laughs> the east gate of the city had a rounded tower the mountain is bisected by a colonnaded street called the Decumanus. The city has a three-sided forum. To the north of the forum is a sacred compound of the city with a succession of temples for Zeus and TK. To the west is a Calibe temple for the commemoration of the emperor. Northeast is a large basilica, the largest discovered in Israel, where portions of several podia survive. To the west are the remains of a small theater called the Novia. About 50 meters south of the Forum are the remains of an artillery post and a bathhouse. But the site is also famous for its churches. In 2001, surface indicators of a church structure were visible in this grassy field. From that field emerged the Northeast Insula Project. It is a 50 by 60 meter area 
to the east of the Basilica and north of the Decumanus. The insulae is bisected by three small streets. The streets provide a convenient way for delineating the excavation areas, the western zone, the central zone, and the eastern zone. In the eastern zone is a peristyle house. The northeast church and its attendant structures are key features of the central zone. And in the western zone are several buildings that we, or actually I, labeled Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta. I'm a Greek prof also. <laughs> the, ex the excavation of the northeast insulae began with an exploration of the remains of the church. Work proceeded out from the church to a large compound. Archaeological description. It might be helpful for you to have that grid at the site as I talk about it. The central zone. In the central zone, the northeast church is a small structure with a single exterior apse. The aisles are separated from the nave by a row of columns. There are two entrances from the west and one from the north. The nave uh, preserves fragments of mosaic flooring in two phases. The original carpet with various decoratory band bandings centered on 12 discs. The discs featured different animals, the margins of which were decorated with birds. The carpet was likely geometric, or excuse me, the later carpet was strictly geometric. Notably, crosses on the floor guarded entrances to the chancel. The most important features, though, of the bar-shaped chancel are two burial sites. North of the central axis is a masonry tomb into which a coffin was placed. On top of it was perched a sarcophagus. A lead pipe for veneration of those buried descended from the surface. At the south end of the chancel is a sarcophagus partially exposed above the floor and faced with crosses and an alpha and omega. A hole was bored through the top of the sarcophagus to venerate the remains of an elderly woman whose remaining bones were arranged under the boring, likely because relics had been extracted. A little video showed you when we were actually opening up that tomb. The church was built to house these two tombs. Immediately to the south of the chancel is a diaconicum of exceptional size in comparison to the church. Its roof rested on two stone arches. Lining the wall are raised benches. In the northeast corner of the room is a sister, the bell of which sits next to the tomb of the revered woman. Behind it, we discovered a hoard of gold jewelry, including a magical healing amulet. A portico for the church was constructed to the west using the small street. A southerly building shares wall, the south wall of the church, is accessed by an antechamber, and contains two small cells and a larger room. Although outside the south gate of the church, it likely mediated access to the church. North of the church are three medial chambers. The western chamber provided access to the church through the church's north wall and to a building to the north by a staircase to the second level. The east room has a geometric mosaic carpet with large crosses protecting access to the chancel. To the north of these chambers is a larger building. The eastern half likely provided storage and was spanned at the midpoint by a stone arch held up, holding up a second story. To the west are rooms used for food preparation, one of which contained an oven. You see the circle. The Eastern Zone. In the Eastern Zone, we exposed a large domestic structure with a three-sided peristyle court. 
peristyle court means you have coverings on three sides and you walk around with the coverings. At the west end of the south portico of the peristyle court is a doorway providing access to the north medial chambers of the church and to the north building, convincing us that the structure in the eastern zone was part of the church compound. To the north of the building proper is a terrace. It has a formal portico to the west. At the east of the terrace is an entrance with a portico held up by marble columns. Those entering were greeted by a tabula ansata inscription wishing, wishing good fortune to the builder, Uticos to Kiteste. Unfortunately, misspelled in the word builder. In the second phase, a cistern, water channels, and at least three pools were added, one of which features a fountain. Analysis of the plasters indicated that they may have been used for flax production. Most significantly, we recovered a fresco of the Roman goddess TK, which had fallen fortuitously face down on the mosaic floor in front of the fountain pool. This recovery is the reason we call the structure the House of TK. It is the only fresco of TK from anywhere in the world. If you want to see it, go to the uh, Israel Museum in Jerusalem. From the eastern portico, one entered a small chamber or foyer decorated with an inscription that read, Enter for Good. To the south of the foyer and east of the peristyle court is a larger room. It may have been the triclinium as fragments of decorative plaster were recovered. Further to the south, less remains of the original domestic structure as the footprint of the building was rebuilt into a large arched room with window walls to the east and west. <clears throat> to the west are two rooms, one adjacent to the apse. The room to the south contained a cistern and a large doorway providing access from the compound south to the rest of the city. The western zone. In the western zone, the street is paved and likely served as a route by which pilgrims and petitioners came to revere the tomb of the elderly woman. Building Alpha consists of four rooms, the storage room to the east, separated from the central room by a window wall, the southwesterly room, and a northwesterly room. The only known access to the building is by an L-shaped staircase from the plaza to the north. The heavy basalt ashlars of the exterior walls suggest something substantive stood above. Building Beta is an L-shaped structure that wraps around the northwest corner of the paved plaza. The floor of the southern room sits half meter below the plaza to the east. The northwest room is more poorly, poorly constructed and was abutted to the south room, perhaps secondarily. The northeast room is of similar construction. Directly to the south is a crudely paved interior courtyard. Building Gamma straddles the south gate of the church complex and was likely part of it. The building consists of two rooms separated by a window wall. The south room has crude paving, likely due to the cistern in the eastern wall. The north room has a bench to the west. Further to the north are remnants of the foundation of a fourth building, which was no longer present at the time of the church compound. The excavation began with the hopes of uncovering a small church. By the end of the project, we revealed several insulae of the northeast part of Hebrus. A tale in time. All those rocks get kind of boring, so now I'm going to move the story back. According to Ashen and Rainey, archaeology is the science of digging a hole and the art of telling a tale. To make sense of these finds, we must next move from artifacts to story, the tale of the Northeast Insula. A tale requires a timeline and terminology that delineates it. After the death of Alexander the Great in 323, his empire was divided among his generals, with the Seleucids 
eventually controlling the Levant in 198 BCE, marking the beginning of the Hellenistic period at Hippos. Coins minted at Hippos identify the site as Antiochia Hippos, alluding to a foundation under one of the Seleucid kings, many of whom were named Antiochus. Political realities changed in 63 BC when Pompey conquered the area and Roman dominance began. With the establishment of the Roman provinces of Arabia and Palestina in the second century CE, Greco-Roman culture flourished in the region. <clears throat> but by the middle of the fourth century, Antiochia Hippos had a new identity as Hippos Palestines, born of its place in the Roman provincial system and of the rise of Christianity under Constantine. This later framework we will call late antique, although it is often labeled Byzantine. The arrival of Islam and the Umayyad dynasty in the seventh century marked the final period at Hippos until a devastating earthquake in 749, after which urban occupation at the site ended. So, the story of Hippos has Hellenistic, Roman, late antique, and Umayyad chapters. Okay? We've laid out the framework. I hope that's clear and you should be able to see that on your chart pretty clearly. To place the material remains of the Northeast Church within this time frame, probes were dug to bedrock under the last surviving floor layer in representative locations throughout the excavation area. These probes give evidence of what preceded the visible late antique remains. Probes in and around the Northeast Church showed meager results and demonstrated that structures forming the final stage were constructed no later than the late 5th or early 6th centuries CE. In every case, Bedrock, bedrock is reached less than a meter under the floor. In addition, the probes did confirm that late antique remains were sometimes built on and, re and reused foundational courses from the Roman imperial period. Look at this wall here. Notice the difference between the foundation courses, nicely cut uh, ashlars, and the later Byzantine built on top. You can really see the difference. Emerging from the probes is a, a chronological assessment of the Northeast Insulae that identifies an occupational phase in the Roman Imperial period and a second phase in the late Antique period with a century of dr dramatic decline and possible disuse in the fifth century. That's why it's marked missing. Evidence is suggested of at least three or perhaps four structures from the Roman imperial period. In the southwest corner of the excavation area, a Roman public building with colonnades occupied the space north of the Decumans. The corner of the stylobate is visible in the floor of building Alpha. See, there's part of the stylobate there, and there it is there. This corner is missing. And its north wall provides the foundational course, uh, is that wall I showed you from the northeast room of the building. So we have a Roman public building in that location in the Roman period. In the eastern part of the excavation area, the peristyle court and some of the walls of the House of TK are from the Roman imperial period, as is its fresco. So we had a large Roman manor house. The unusual configuration of the entrances to the Northeast Church suggests that a cistern and attendant pavers were part of an earlier courtyard serving a domestic structure of similar size. The Roman era foundation for building Delta could be a similar, smaller structure. So this is what we think the area looked like in the Roman Imperial. The transition between these two phases 
is clarified by the coin profile, which yielded some 45 datable coins. The coins span a period typically identified with the occupations of the site. A cluster of the coins is from the 3rd and 4th century, a period of significant Roman activity and prosperity in the Galilee and surrounding areas. It is this, during this period that the Northeast Insulae contain wealthy homes, of which the House of TK is the primary example. This period was interrupted by the earthquake in 363 that destroyed the Basilica, which is just to the west of our area, and as with other economic, as with other sites, economic activity can continue for several decades, but the project has no coins from the fifth century. Apparently, he both experienced a decline, if not a collapse at this time. Coins also support the proposed chronology of the late antique period. The Northeast Church and its related compound were constructed into the ruins of the Roman Imperial period in the late 5th and early 6th century. Several 6th and 7th century coins were recovered at or near floor level in the structure that was the House of Decay in the Roman Imperial period. Rather than a gradual transition from one period to the next, the coins confirm that the remains of the late antique period were built into the ruins of the earthquake from 363, more than a century later. There was no gradual transition from one period to the next. But within the late antique period, two phases are indicated by the floors of the Northeast Church, with the ornate first floor supplanted by a later geometric floor in the nave. But more may have been involved. The south aisle is separated from the nave by a row of four columns set on the style of it. The intercolumnation, that's the distance between the columns, averages 2.1 meters. In the north aisle, the style of it is of similar construction. However, the column bases and placement show a different variance. Visible are five intact columns. The intercolumnation averages 1.1 meter, except between the third and fourth bases from the east, where the intercolumnation is 2.7. But if a similar column base were placed in the middle of the gap, done in blue in this diagram, then all the intercolumnations would average 1.1 meter. In that case, there would be six bases for the north aisle and four for the south, which you never find in a Byzantine church. Never unless it was damaged and rebuilt. You know, if part of your garage falls down and you put it back up, what do you do with that side that fell down? You reinforce it, right? Okay, I think that's what's going on. More, moreover, we recovered from the destruction field of the North Isle several equally sized corbels. These corbels had been used to build the North Wall, and identical corbels were used create a bench along, along the north wall, which sits on top of the original mosaic floor, suggesting the corbels forming the bench and the corbels used, used in the wall were installed as part of a later major repair. The unusual intercolumnation of the north aisle, along with the repair of the wall and the addition of benches, suggest a major repair following the incident, possibly the earthquake of 551, which I have on there, or the Sassanid Persian invasion of 602 to 628. A site 10 kilometers north of us was heavily damaged by the Persians. In 637 CE, Jerusalem surrendered to Caliph Umar. Basically, he walked in. <laughs> Subsequently, the Umayyad Caliphate controlled Palestine. But signs of decline were already significant at Epos by the 8th century. During the reign of Abd al-Malik, 685-705, known for the construction of the Dome of the Rock, a new road was constructed in the southern Golan to create a highway from Tiberias on the east side of the lake around to Damascus. 
Although the identity of Hippos continues in literary references, notice the road bypasses Hippos by about five kilometers. The city was no longer significant by that size. Prior to the earthquake of 749, liturgical rites ceased at the Northeast Church. Burials stopped, reliquaries were removed. All the doors of the church were intentionally sealed, except the entrance to the south aisle, which gave access to the tomb of the elderly woman. The southern structure had its doorways closed. The north building was sealed off. Similarly, the house of TK, the principal doorway from the south portico or the peristyle court, and the west doorway from the southwest room were blocked. What remained accessible after the decommissioning became a mausoleum and was little used or abandoned before the earthquake of 749. One question remains about this complex surrounding the Northeast Church. What was its function? We propose that it was an urban monastery. To make this case, we use four criteria proposed by Hein Goldfuss by which one can characterize urban monasticism and monastic complexes. His first indicator is, these are the four, his first indicator is defining an urban monastery is its location in the city. Since the compound is on the top of the mountain and inside its defensive walls, it is located within the city limits and thus an urban compound. Moreover, the compound is in the urban core, less than 100 meters from the forum, in what may have been a wealthy neighborhood, a, a neighborhood of wealthy homes, a small church of similar footprint is positioned within the earlier Roman street grid and incorporated walls of an earlier building, sets some of its walls on the foundation of other buildings, and has an irregular configuration of entrances re resulting from reuse of part of an earlier peristyle court. The Northeast Church replaced an urban peristyle house. The compound in the Northeast Insula is consistent with the first indicator proposed by Goldfuss. Goldfuss attends to the size, dimension, and spatial plan as a second indicator of a monastery. As we have noted above, the compound consists of five interconnected structures, the interconnection of which is demonstrated by the passageways among them. The interconnection is further confirmed by the intentional decommissioning of most of the buildings of the complex, seemingly at the same time. The third indicator following Goldfuss is the presence of burials in the church. At the south end of the chancel is a prominent tomb containing the bones of a single, small, elderly woman. The example resembles that of a tomb in the monastery at Scythopolis, which reserves the tomb for Lady Mary, who founded the church. We should expect a considerable number of monasteries for women in urban contexts, as the environment is safer than the desert, and as pious and wealthy Christian widows often took up monastic life. A second masonry tomb is, as we noted, under the floor of the chancel. Here, it's interesting. Of the 12 individuals in the tomb, all were adults, except for one infant. As for the genders, at least three were men and three women. The mix of ages and genders might also suggest a different practice in urban monasteries from the celibacy of monks in the desert. These two burial locations, both in the chancel and both venerating those in turn, are significant indicators for identifying the complex as an urban mon monastery. If the complex is monastic in some form, an identifiable function for the complex would further the case. This is Goldfuss's fourth indicator. Certainly, the veneration of the elderly woman was part of the function of the complex, even after it was decommissioned. 
However, the cult of the elderly woman may have involved more than a memorial. In the late antique period, people turned to two different sources when seeking cures from illnesses. To the physician trained in, Greco in the Greco-Roman tradition and to faith healing. Such miraculous cures might be provided by a holy person, by the relics of a saint, or by a shrine at a hagios topos, that is, a holy place. Among the methods of healing were incubation, sitting and praying, kissing the tomb, anointing oneself with oil from the lamp suspended above the saint's tomb, drinking oil or water that had come into the contact with the relics. Remember that sister next to the tomb? At Hippos Palestines, two such saints, Damien and Cosmos, were commemorated by an inscription in the baptistry of the cathedral next to the chancel the and the tomb of the elderly woman is that oversized diaconica. Its only entrance is right adjacent to the tomb of the woman. We suggest that this room was a Hagias Topos, or a healing cult that grew from the veneration of the elderly woman. The presence of the sister suggests a healing function. The discovery of a healing amulet nearby, although pagan, supports the hypothesis. A third piece of evidence is the ancient pollen signature left on the plaster surfaces of the Via Conica indicating that as many as 14 ancient herbal plants were utilized for the purpose of a healing within its confines. Let me give you a sense of that. Cyclamen was used for wound dressing. A poultice of glaucium for sore eyes. A concoction of Hieroschiamus was used as a suppository treatment and for earaches and constipation. Theophrastus identifies the root and fruit of Veratra as a useful purge. It is mixed with wine prior to being drunk. Taraxacum, dandelion, mixed with wine is an antidote against snake bite and boiled in wine or even ingested whole is a cure for bowel ailments. Dioscorides prescribes a concoction of crocus as an aromatic that when rubbed on the head or nostrils serves both as a warming agent and a sleep inducer. He also recommends it for boils and the hardening of the uterus. One mixes artissima with almond oil and applies it as a compress for some stomach aches and as a body rub for weakness. One can put small portions of atropa, belladonna leaf, into wine to induce sleep. In small amounts, conium, aka hemlock, can be used, can be used beneficially as a sedative or an antispasmodic. In large amounts, it can be used for euthanasia. A leaf of mandrake is mixed with barley to make a poultice for wounds. Ephedra discharges blood from the nostrils, stops that. Mixed with wine, it helps with dysentery and induces urine. A pavar rope ass, when ingested, induces sleep and relieves pain. The leaves of I left the word polypodium. Of polypodium are added to the vinegar as a cure for wounds and to remove inflammation. Now, sania is an aromatic and is used for a variety of circulatory problems. This healing site was well resourced with herbs. Notably, the therapeutic strategy of earliest Christians was quite simple in comparison to other practitioners. Remember the story in the Bible of the woman with the flow of blood. Okay. 
Christians did not perceive, initially, a need for pharmaceuticals. Tatian, the noted Christian polemicist of the second century, portrays the whole pharmaceutical enterprise as a satanic artifice. Pharmacy in all of its forms is due to the same artificial de device. If, if anyone is healed by matter because he trusts it, all the more he will be healed if in himself he relies on the power of God. But with the rise of monasticism in the fourth century, certain ascetics acquired a reputation both of personal holiness and of effectiveness in bringing about healing. These prayers of monks were sought by many across ancient society and were thought to play a significant role in healing. For example, Antony of Egypt was a noted healer. Stanley Herakas has pointed out, though, that holy men devoted to perfecting themselves spiritually when they performed more mundane healings for people, also employed a wide variety of material means in these endeavors. Aided and abetted by their holiness, Heraclitus writes, holy men used the panoply of prayer together with their medical skills, folk wisdom, and herbal lore to cure the ills of others. Andrew Puss notes, in the early Christian, excuse me, early Egyptian Zenobia, the traditions of Egyptian medicine were observed both in the classification of diseases and in pharmaceutical therapy. Medical manuscripts and inscriptions from, late, from the late antique Zenobia, as well as testimony from monastic writers, show the pharmaceutical techniques advised and maladies treated. In the monasticism of the Greek East, with only a few exceptions, Monastics used the Greek medical tradition also. The cumulative evidence from the Northeast Insulae makes a strong case that the monastery served as a hagios topos, a healing site for the community. The need for such a facility may have been precipitated by the plague of Justinian, the outbreak of an infectious disease that occurred in Egypt in 541 spread quickly to Palestine and remained virulent in the East for, I hope this doesn't hurt to hear, two centuries with 15 to 18 multi-year surges. Admittedly, the 6th century pharmacopoeia was of negligible use in treating the plague. Nonetheless, a monastic hagios topos, serving a community by invoking the holiness of a revered woman, providing space in her presence to rest and recover, employing pharmaceutical approaches reliant on Galen and Dioscorides, and even allowing the use of healing amulets, is consistent with the literary sources of the time and the emergence of such practices in the Greek East. Seemingly, faith and pharmacology brought some relief and hope in the context of the revered memory of a now unknown woman. Future research. A compound comprising five interconnected buildings surrounding the Northeast Church at Hippos, Palestinus, may have been an urban monastery. While the lack of specific literary or inscriptional evidence requires that the identification of this monastic compound be at best tentative, the material remains from the Northeast Insulite ought to be part of any study of urban monasticism in Palestina. I'm still arguing with the guy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem who will not include this site in his catalog of all the monasteries in the late antique period. I hope to see him in Jerusalem and maybe over a beer we can settle that. <laughs> the Northeast Insulot I project calls for further research also into urban monasticism, specifically the identification, definition of, and practices within which such communities work. Even the composition of such communities may be open to discussion in view of the remains from the masonry tomb in the church. 
lastly, healing cults, the rise of Hagioi Topoi, and the use of herbals within them merit traditional synthesis. As with any archaeological project, the work has only begun. Thank you. Okay, we've got a nice block of time for your questions. Any thought of uh, the significance of the elderly woman? Well, she or was. Who, who she was? Well, you know, we, for 16 years of excavation, we were hoping and hoping to find an inscription that would name her. But the floor of the church was so torn up that we couldn't. In that northerly building I told you about, when we were ex ex cleared, cleaning out the destruction field, we came up with a whole bunch of monast uh, or mosaic flooring that had collapsed from a second floor. All sorts of letters, two different sizes, but no more than two letters together, so we couldn't reconstruct them. So we don't know. Now, a colleague of mine, who excavated a church to the west of ours, where they have an inscription that names, for, that in the inscription says, for the eternal rest of Antonia, a diaconisses, a deaconess, that she thinks that our woman is that person, but we have no evidence of it. Clearly an important, very important person. The church was built to house her tomb. It's from the first phase of the church. The floor is laid right up next to it. It wasn't cut into the floor and inserted later. Uh, but who she was, we don't know. We do know her, some of her bones were extracted from the tomb because when we opened that tomb, only part of her skeleton was there and it wasn't laid out as you would expect. The, the remaining bones were gathered under that anointing hole. But we did find her toes at the east end, which meant originally she had been buried on her back, normal position, and therefore, along with some physical evidence on the tomb itself, we were convinced it had been pried open for the extraction of relics. That's one way in which you can fund your church in the Byzantine period, is by selling relics. I'm not suggesting we go out to the cemeteries because our churches <laughs> get a piece of Grandma Schmidt, although I don't think we get as much money for it either. Probably not. Um, other so, questions? So, so kind of in the same vein, then, if you said this, uh, just repeat yourself, you know, what, when was, when was she buried? I mean, we, don't, we probably don't have a, a, date, a death date, but like, what century? When, well, the church was built in the late 5th or early 6th century. Okay, okay. So it would be... 490 to 510, somewhere in there. Okay. It was built to house her tomb. Okay. So she would have been late 4th century. Okay. And she was elderly, 60, 65. Right. She had a severe case of osteoporosis. She would have shrunk over like, I mean, really right. bad. Right. Um, the anthropologist said it was one of the worst cases of osteoporosis he had seen in it. in ancient bones. Um, so. Another uh, another question. So you had the pollen sample. Like how do you, so pollen was preserved? You had this pollen from centuries ago? Or how okay. did you? What, what, had, what had happened is because there was so much pollen of these herbals used in that place, over time, it got embedded by use into the plaster of the floor and the wall, and there was a little niche there. And so what we did is a colleague of mine from University of San Diego is the one who perfected the technique. He took little drillings of that plaster, treated, treated, there's a chemical process by which it's treated. That causes the pollen that got stuck to yeah. the surface to come loose. Then that is fished out, put on a slide, and then using a catalog of what these pollens look like, they do counts. And you have to have 200 counts. 200 count to have statistical significance. If we have at least eight right. out of 200 are a particular, then that one is statistically significant. Most of our herbals were 25, 40 out of the 200. Wow. But yeah, it's, it's so much was you know, hung from the ceiling, fell to the floor, was walked over over you know, a couple hundred years. Um, worked its way in 
But yeah, we extracted this from the plaster. It was not mixed in making the plaster. It was on the surface. Right, right. So we only took out like you know half a centimeter of plaster. But we had a pretty good plaster floor, and we had some plaster on the walls and the benches, and then there was a little niche, uh, which was probably where they put the more valuable um, herbs after they've been mixed. Um, you know, you've, you've all seen these uh, scenes from various movies of some guy making stuff or some woman making stuff in a sort of a hut and they have them setting all over the place. It's a mess. That's probably what this was like. Right. Yeah. But um, the benches are higher. They're not sitting benches. We have other benches that are sitting. They're only about um, about um, 15 to 18 centimeters above the floor. These were 30 some. And they were wide enough for a person to lay on. And in the Byzantine period, the typical adult male was five one five two, so I had a couple of my short guys lay down and they fit just fine. Right. So. Is there any uh, water source in that area? Uh, yes, not on the mountain. There was a, an aqueduct from, well, there were at least two aqueducts, but the major aqueduct was from the spring about six kilometers away, and it was a pipe aqueduct, so it was a siphon. It would come, come from a higher spot to Golan, down in the valley. It actually came up that route you know, that we walked in every day. We found pieces of it. It ran under that main road that went through the city. We found pieces of it under that road, still intact, and it dumped into a large cistern, massive, twice the size of this room, under that fork. Then there were also many cisterns where you collect water off the yeah, earth. Yeah. I'm sure getting, the, getting water to the top of a hill is not necessarily easy. No, that's why you use a That's right. why, as long as your water source is higher right. than where you're eventually going to be, you can run, you can siphon. It's right. like siphoning gas out of a car. People used to do that, believe it or not. In the days when gas got up to 50 cents a gallon. <laughs> <laughs> High school kids would go and siphon something out of siphon something out of the teacher's car in the parking lot because they didn't want to pay that much. I have a question just more about the process and like what your average day there would look okay. like. Our, our typical season was in the summer, four to five weeks, Sunday to Thursday, uh, because Friday is the Muslim holy day, Saturday is the Jewish holy day, and Christians don't count because they're very small number. So the work day is Sunday to Thursday. We would get up at 4 30. We would be at the base of that saddle uh, by quarter of five. We were stumbling up it, you know, mostly dark. We're at the site by five o'clock. We work for three hours and we break for breakfast and we brought stuff up on a tractor. Because uh, that's something you get up to the top. Now, now they, they're getting ready to open it as a national park. Uh, so now they graded the roads and they actually have toilets on the side. <laughs> toilets. <laughs> 20 years without toilets. And like poor women, you know, we always had to send the women off two by two when someone needed, you know, it's one to guard and the other one to hide behind a bush. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, but um, we were stricter than some of the other teams. Um, we did not use any mechanical means for excavation and machines unless we had something that was just too heavy for us to lift like a nine meter solid marble column that had tipped over. There's no way, my folks. But we did develop techniques uh, using uh, cargo netting. Uh, the hard thing when you're trying to lift a heavy stone out of the square is getting a good grip on it. So one of our guys came up with the idea of getting heavy duty cargo netting that we would double fold. And then you put the thing on the cargo net and wrap it and lift it very easily and safely. And we've developed some techniques, so we got pretty good lifting pretty heavy stuff. But occasionally we had to call the tractor. Um, when we opened that central tomb, we lifted the sarcoph sarcophagus out. That we needed a tractor for. Um, and of course, everybody from the excavation was there when we were lifting the <laughs> sarcophagus out. Where are they gonna find them? What was the estimated population of that town? Well, within the walls, 
within the walls of the compound, maybe three to 4,000 at its height. There is a domestic quarter. Some work has been done in that area, but not a lot. Um, but the city declined very rapidly, especially after the sixth century. And we have evidence, you know, because they start burying inside the city walls, that indicates the used part of the city has shrunk. Okay. Um, however, if you want to think of villages and farming huts and all of that, all around the site on the hillsides. Now there were there were, were two large necropolis places for burial outside. This is probably the site. You remember the story of Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee and he goes to this city, sometimes it's called Jerusalem, sometimes Gadara, it has various names. And as he's approaching the city, this crazy guy comes out of the tombs. Well, as you go into Hebrews, you're going right through the necropolis and right by the tombs. So this is that's probably the location. It's also probably the city set on a hill, because it's the only city set on a hill around the Sea of Galilee that could be seen from the city. So, I mean, when you got there, obviously it wasn't nice and dug out. Like you, no, that okay, picture so, I showed you, right. the grassy field. Right. Arthur Siegel, who was the head archaeologist, took me to this that part of the site and said, sure. "What do you see here?" And I said, "I think there's a church there." And he says, "I give it to you. Dig it up." <laughs> so, how, so, how deep did you have to dig? Uh, it varied. Okay. Um, so, uh, in part of the house of TK, we were going down three and a half to four meters. Okay. Uh, in parts of the church. Half a meter, you know, there was a hollow spot of half a meter. But typically, a meter to, to two meter, you know, a meter and a half to two meters is not uncommon. Right. Uh, but part of the house of TK, especially getting down to those uh, on the on the north terrace, some of those things, that was that was three meters down, and that's a lot of digging because you can't you can't lift it up. You have to have somebody standing on something halfway up, and you're lifting the buckets up. So you're mm -hmm. passing buckets up. Fortunately, okay. that years I had a bunch of crazy people in Concordia, Irvine, <laughs> with a colleague of mine. They were really good at handling this stuff. So there was a, yeah, there's lots of those volunteers in your report. There's, yeah, you know, yeah. At least well, you pages. can't do archaeology right. without volunteers. Right, right. That's that's how it works. Yeah. You mentioned the um, crosses guarding the uh, yes. passageways. Right. Doorways. That's those those apo apotropaic. That's the technical term for it's meant to keep the devil out. That's the purpose of it. Those were so, at every. Yeah. Um, where there was floor still surviving, the side entrance to the chancel, that big, huge cross, not this big, beautiful, uh, at the head of the north aisle, that's where those four rather plain crosses were. In the center aisle, that floor was all gone. South Isle also the floor was all gone. But where we had floor, and there was an entrance into the chancel, there were crosses on the floor. And, and yeah, it's half a trip It's meant to keep the devil out. Okay. Good questions. <coughs> There's about five more minutes, and I know he needs to run. Yeah. So <laughs> just so you know, he's not walking out because he's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, appreciate it. I'm, I'm the pastor, so I'm full of questions. And this, this may or not may or may not be relevant, but what I thought of with the title at least of pharmacology, I thought of something like, I mean, Revelation 21, where it talks about sorcery. I mean, I know at the moment is it a false it's a false cognate. I mean, or would they have understood, you know, yeah. when they talk um, about pharmacos in that in that verse, would right. it be stuff like those herbs or would it be something different? And it's maybe maybe that's not, well, yeah. not you, there you there know. was there was a whole range of from the you know, the, the Greco-Roman he, uh, healing tradition, Galen, Dioscorides, right. Prastus, heavily heavy use of herbs. Sure. And then also, um, I mean, even Galen said, the person is dying. Yeah. Use, use amulet, use anything. So right. when we found that pagan amulet in a church, right. of all right. things, I, I got a hold of an expert down in Texas, an expert on, on amulets. He said, where did you find that? I think we in the church. Um, but we think that what's going on there is 
it, people were so desperate they tried anything. Right, right. And, you know, you've got a couple of major clinics around here who are dealing with really, really tough cases. And you know that in addition to the good medicine that's used, sometimes people also do other things. Right. You know, sort of cover all the bases just in case. Right. And when you're dealing with something like the bubonic plague, which is what Justinian, plague of Justinian was, it was the first instance of the bubonic plague. Um, you know, that killed people within three or four days. And, right. and the death was not, was miserable, right. hard. And so I'm not surprised at all that people would throw anything they could. Anything they could. Obviously, with church history, you know, we realize the church always, it wasn't always as perfect as we think it once was. You know, early church people might say, oh, it was perfect back then, but all. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that I've argued in, in some of my writing about this site is um, as Christianity came, as this pagan city came to be, and did come to be, the largest Christian site on the Sea of Galilee. In the Byzantine period, the largest Jewish site was Tiberius. That was the center of the Jewish world. Now the temple was no more. Capernaum was a mixed city, Jews and Christians. The largest Christian site on the Sea of Galilee was Epos. But that transition does not mean people, once they became Christian, immediately abandoned everything of their pagan lifestyle. Right. We still, well into, well into the Byzantine period, we see people uh, honoring TK, the goddess of fortune. Eutychos to taste it. Good fortune. Good luck. Right. Um, I was a pastor in Iowa. I visited plenty of farmers who, when I go out and see them in the barn, what was above the door? The shoot, the horseshoe, yeah. for good luck. Okay. Right. <laughs> it's not exactly Christian, but it's there. You know, and it's not the first. Probably somebody earlier in the family put it up there and just nobody ever took it down. Right. And, you know, with people. But you know, that's just the way people are. So. That's just, that's just life, right? A lot, a lot of, a lot of pagan life continued. I mean, we we found in some of the remains of the church in one room, we found a little hoard of things, a couple of fancy bottles, and there was a bone carving of a maenad. Now, maenad is a consort for Dionysus. The Dionysic cult is, of course, cult of wine drunkenness, debauchery, and this may not is clearly somebody who's dancing in frenzy. And I said, well, this is the Lady Gaga of Hebrews. <laughs> right. you know? But we found that in the ruins of this church compound. Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't know what it was. Maybe it had passed on. Maybe somebody traded for it. Maybe somebody wanted it. We found little games drawn on the street in other places. We know that they did those kind of things. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. I hope this was, after we got by the boring stones and rocks part, I hope it got a little more interesting as we told the story. But, you know, I really like Ezra Rainey's statement. Archaeology is the science of digging a hole and the art of telling it. Really, that captures it. It's not Indiana Jones. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, you didn't have to fight any monsters or whatever. So we had snakes, scorpions, uh, dead bodies, okay, and some of the Israelis carried guns. Oh, well, there you go. So, okay. Well, I guess everyone, please give a round of applause. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Free tomorrow morning. He'll be at Faith at nine from nine to ele uh, nine to eleven to present on more kind of Jesus and archaeology or Jesus and history. So yeah. hope you guys can make it tomorrow as well, and uh, we'll love to see you there. Yeah. That so. one's less formal. <laughs> yes, very good. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.